Welcome. In this session, I'd like to talk about Chinese tech companies and more specifically about the Chinese government's crackdown on these companies. Let's start by setting the table. For most of the last 20 years, China has been the big story in both the global economy and in capital markets. And in fact, its rise, its growth and its infrastructure investments have helped to keep the global economy going. But for those people willing to look behind the curtain, it's always been true that investments in China, public or private, the Chinese government is your partner, implicitly or explicitly. And if the Chinese government were actively working against you, it's difficult to make the investment work. Now, non-Chinese companies have always recognized this reality and bent over backwards trying to accommodate the Chinese government. As I see it, Google and Apple will accept constraints on investments in China that they would not accept in investments anywhere else in the world. Now, for a long time, we assumed that Chinese companies were not subject to those same constraints. And that was especially true, we thought, of the big Chinese tech companies. The Alibabas, the Tencents, the JD.coms. The last year or so, the Chinese government has cracked down on these companies. It's been a shock to the companies, it's been a shock to investors in the company. And I thought I would use this session to talk a little bit about why that crackdown might be happening and how to incorporate it if you're an investor into how you value and, and invest in these companies. So let's start by getting some perspective here. If you look at the Chinese economy and its place in the global economy, the best way to get some perspective is to go back a really, really long time. You say, how long is really, really long? to 180, look at the last 2,000 years. Look at the last 2,000 years. For much of that period, in fact, all the way through almost 1,700 or so, the two biggest economies in the world were India and China. Now, if you're Indian and Chinese, before you start patting yourself on the back too much, there was a very simple reason for this. In the days when human labor was the prime driver of production, GDP was proportional to population and India and China had the largest populations of the world and therefore contributed the most to global GDP. The 1700s, of course, you had the Industrial Revolution and that broke the link between population and GDP. In fact, both India and China have slid down the scale in terms of being proportions of the global economy and by the time you get to 2000, you can see that there are small parts of a very big global, global economy. But during the last few decades, we've seen a resurgence in China. In this graph, I've looked at Chinese GDP relative to US and the rest of the world going back to 1960. And as you look across time between 1960 and 1978, China kind of stayed stuck around maybe 5%, four, less than 5% of global GDP. But as you can see in the last four decades, and especially in the last two decades, China has grown to become the second largest economy in the world. In fact, by 2020, China is close to 18, almost 20% of, of global GDP. The US has dropped to about 25%, and they're now the two biggest economies in the world. But China is clearly the bigger growth story. To, to get a little more perspective on how much China's contributed global growth, I decided to look at change in world GDP in every decade from the 1960s to the last one, and how much of that change could be attributed to China. And you can look that during the 20th century, China was a small part of the global economy. It didn't contribute very much. But take a look at how much of the growth in the last 20 years the global economy has come from China. Between 2001 and 2010, the Chinese economy ac accounted for 14.44% of all of global growth. But in the next decade, 2011 through 20, almost two thirds of global growth came from China. In fact, without China growing, the global economy would have been almost flat for the last 10 years. So clearly, there is a growth story here. China has been the big success story of global economic growth. Now, as the Chinese economy has grown, Chinese financial markets have grown with them. Perhaps not proportionately, but you can see the rise. 
In this graph, I've looked at the market caps, not the GDPs, of China, the US, and the rest of the world, and graphed out again, as I did with GDP, the percentage of global market cap that comes from China and the US. The US remains the dominant market cap region in the world, but you can see again the rise of China. From less than 1% of global market cap, it's risen to more than 10% by 2020. Now, as Chinese financial markets have risen, especially in the last decade, we've seen the rise of Chinese debt. Just to give you some perspective, between 2001 and 2010, as China grew, the biggest Chinese companies were financial service companies with a few infrastructure companies. On December 31st, 2010, if you rank the 15 largest Chinese companies by market cap, there are only two tech companies on that list, Tencent and Baidu, and they came down towards the bottom of the list. Take a look on December 31st, 2020, at the 15 largest market cap companies in China. Not only are, five, are six of them tech companies, but the two largest market cap companies in China were Tencent and Alibaba. I've listed everything in US dollars just to make sure things stay comparable. Clearly, not only has the Chinese economy grown and Chinese markets grown with them, but tech has become a larger and larger part of the economy. Now, if you're trying to explain it, part of you says, what's the big deal? Isn't the same thing true for the U.S.? And it's true that in the U.S., in the last decade, six stocks, the Fangam stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple, and Microsoft, accounted for a huge portion of the increase in market cap in the U.S. Tech was a big driver of U.S. market capitalization in the last decade. So it's true. Some of the rise you're seeing of Chinese tech reflects a global rise of tech. But there is an advantage to looking at the big winners in the tech business. It's part of the reason I looked at the Fangam stocks in the US and part of the reason I'm going to be looking at the biggest tech winners in China to see what I can learn about the tech sector in China and both the promise and its peril. The four stocks or the four Chinese tech companies I'm going to focus on are Tencent and Alibaba because of the two biggest market cap companies, JD.com because it's on that list as well. And the fourth company is DD. DD, of course, is only a $40 billion market cap company in US dollar terms, but it was one of the highest profile IPOs of 2021. So I thought I'd focus on these four companies. Very different companies in many ways, but perhaps we can learn something about Chinese technology from each of these companies. So let's start with Tencent. Tencent is the old company in this group. It's been around for 20 years plus. If you, if you think about when it was founded. And it's in almost every aspect of the online business in China. Its core is built around video gaming and social networking. For those of you not familiar with WeChat, it has more than a billion users. It is, in fact, the Facebook. And the, it's not just Facebook. It replaces a bunch of other social media platforms in China. But that core is supplemented by an increasing role that Tencent plays in FinTech because it is a WeBank and part of WeChat is WePay. And as well as business services, Tencent is increasingly entering the cloud business. So if you look at this graph, here are some of the things that jump out at you. Clearly, revenue growth was astronomical in percentage terms between 2000 and one in 2010. But to me, the most impressive numbers for Tencent are not what they did between 2000 and 2010 when they were a small company. It's what they've been able to sustain between 2011 and 20. As a big company, they've been able to maintain a compounded annual revenue growth rate of almost 38% while preserving sky high margins. Again, the margins have come down from the 46% you saw in the prior decade, but 28% is pretty impressive. So if you look at the revenue breakdown, you can see 55% comes from gaming and social network. Advertising is 17%. FinTech is 27%. Other is 1%. So that gives you a picture of Tencent, the company. Let's move on to Alibaba. Alibaba is a much younger company than Tencent. It's been around a while, but it's been public only for the last six, seven years. 
It's often described as, a, as China's Amazon, but it's not quite that. Because unlike Amazon, which maintains a retail storefront and inventory and tries to sell things through that platform, Alibaba is an intermediary. A big chunk of, of online retail traffic in China traveled through one of Alibaba's two platforms, Taobao and Tmall. And what Alibaba does is it collects a small percentage of each transaction that happens on its platform. It makes money on volume. The percentage it collects might be tiny, but a small percentage of a huge volume can still be astronom astronomical. And you can see its success play out. Its revenues have gone from 34 billion to almost 717 billion yuan. That's a 20-fold increase in revenues over eight years. Its margins have come down. But they were sky high to begin with. So even if you look at the margins in 2021 being lower than they were in 2020, that's still a pretty impressive 15%. So this again is a company that's been able to grow its revenues, maintain solid margins, and get its revenues from the growth in online retailing in China. Now it should be noted that Jack Ma, who founded Alibaba, also founded Alipay which is the payment mechanism that many people use on the Alibaba platforms. Alibaba owns a piece of Alipay, but it's a separate company. It's now called Ant Financial. And in 2020, Ant Financial actually planned to go public, but was stopped. We'll come back and talk about why. But that's part of the story as well. So primarily an advertising company that makes its advertising through online retail with a little bit of cloud computing, but not as diverse as Tencent, as you can see from the pie chart. Let's move on to JD.com. Now, if there's a company that you should be calling China's Amazon, it's JD.com. It is a company that's a more conventional online retailer, maintains inventory, sells goods, makes money on the difference between its prices and its costs. But it's like Amazon in another way as well. It's a company that has always prioritized revenue growth over margins. Now, one way I described the Amazon story early in its life was I called it my field of dreams story. If you're wondering what I'm talking about in the field of dreams, the movie, Kevin Costner says, if we build it, they will come. The JD.com story is very similar. It's focused on building revenues and hoping that margins catch up. Now, the revenue growth rate has come down, but remember the company is now a much bigger company. So if you look at the black line, that's a revenue growth rate. But the margins have never taken off. This is a company with slim margins. You can't blame COVID for this because the margins were slim even coming into COVID. Slim to negative margins with very high revenue growth. And it's a company that's mostly retail, though there are a few other businesses it's drying out. And the final company I'm going to focus on is Didi. <clears throat> if you take an Uber or Lyft, you're familiar with what Didi does. Didi is a ride-sharing company. It, it was founded three years after Uber was founded. And initially, it went head-to-head -head with, you know, the, with the local Chinese ride-sharing companies, bought out its competitor, then went head-to-head -head against Uber and impressively knocked Uber China out of the game. Uber sold its Chinese business to Didi. So now it sits as the dominant ride-sharing company in China. Now, of course, as with every ride-sharing company, Didi describes itself as a logistics company. It's trying to do a little more delivery, but the bulk of its revenues still come from ride-sharing. There's not that much history because the company hasn't been around for as long. But if you look at its history, there are a couple of things that jump out at you. Neither is particularly good if you're thinking about prospective value and story. The first is if you look at the last three years, post Uber China acquisition, the revenues have stagnated. There's not, I mean, you, in you know, 2020, of course, you can blame COVID, but even in 2019, the growth rate was down to 14%. And the margins have been negative. This is a money losing, cash burning machine. And if ride sharing is a money, make, money losing, ride sharing business, this is ride sharing on steroids, a company that grows faster and manages to lose more money and burn through more cash than almost any other ride sharing company in the world. 
So with that background, let's talk a little bit about what these companies have in common, even though they might be in different businesses and have different, different model, business models. The first is they have big markets, and I'm going to say they have big markets quite you think, what are you talking about? You know, let's face it, one of the attractions of any company invested in growing in China, operating in China, is with a billion plus people and economic growth, China is a big market. Now, if you add on top of that technology where you're disrupting existing businesses and taking away market share from existing businesses, you have the potential for big markets in car service and online retail. With Chinese tech companies, you get big market squared. You get China plus a disruptive market. Are you surprised that people are excited about Chinese tech companies? Now, of course, there is a downside when big markets are the primary basis for your investing. One downside is what I call the big market delusion. I've written about this before, where in your big market, you often tend to get blinded to all of the weaknesses of business models and not recognize how difficult it can be to convert big markets to big profits. The second is because China is such a big market by itself, Chinese tech companies tend to be very focused in China because it's easier for them to grow and make money in China than elsewhere. So one of the things you will see as you look at the valuations of these companies is that they're primarily operating in China. They have global ambitions, at least in words, but if you look at their operations, they still remain primarily Chinese. In fact, JD.com and DD are almost entirely Chinese companies. Tencent probably has the biggest non-Chinese operations of these four companies, followed by Alibaba. But if you compare the Chinese tech companies to the U.S. tech companies, they tend to be much more focused on domestic growth. Here's the second commonality. Now, it's easy to say these companies got successful because they were in a big market, but it's worth remembering that as little as 20, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, these companies were small companies and very much part of the pack of companies attacking the Chinese market. Often they were competing with much bigger foreign play players, primarily US tech companies. So they must have done something special that allowed them to separate themselves from the pack. Now the story might be different for each of the four companies, but one thing I think they share in common is each of these companies I think is attuned enough to the Chinese consumer to, re to realize that just aping or copying what Chinese tech, U.S. tech companies were doing wasn't going to work for them. I'll give you my favorite example. Now, when Alibaba when entered the market in the early 2000s, it was competing against eBay, and people assumed that eBay would crush Alibaba. Why, well, it had more resources, it knew how to approach the market, but Alibaba won that battle. You know why it won that battle? I like the, the way The Economist described Alibaba. They called Alibaba the world's greatest bazaar. And what Alibaba did was it created a marketplace for the Chinese consumer. Chinese consumers don't want to order and reason like, you know, like, in, like U.S. consumers might. So Alibaba built them a bazaar. It built payment mechanisms to reflect the fact that Chinese consumers might not trust putting their online information on financial data. It built itself for the Chinese consumer, and it won. Tencent, as a gaming platform, devised itself as a platform to meet the needs of Chinese consumers. And WeChat was well ahead of the game in terms of what companies elsewhere in the world thought about offering as a platform where people could talk to each other. Initially, Didi as a ride-sharing company looked like a Uber wannabe. But Didi very quickly started creating local partnerships and kind of modeled itself on what worked locally. And very quickly, Uber was not able to compete. Put simply, these companies succeeded not just because they were Chinese companies, but because they created models that fit Chinese consumers. Third, and this is not a good thing that they all share, each of these companies is a corporate governance nightmare. Now, the one company that I think ranks better than the rest is Tencent. Tencent is a Hong Kong listed company. Don't, don't get me wrong. 
It's not like shareholders in Tencent have a great deal of power, but at least you know what you're getting. The other three companies on my list, DD, Alibaba, and JD.com, are not listed in China. They're not incorporated in China. They're incorporated in the Cayman Islands. Think about it, Cayman Islands. They're sh he's saying, and they're traded on the NASDAQ. Now, to, to understand why this contrivance exists, it's worth noting that these companies are all constructed as what are called variable interest entities. Here's a fancy way of what, what they, what's actually happened here. You've got the Chinese operating companies, and these companies all are basic, chi basically Chinese operating companies. And what each of them has done is created a shell company in the Cayman Islands. That shell company is what's traded on the NASDAQ. So when you buy shares in Alibaba, you're not buying shares in Alibaba, the Chinese operating company, you're buying shares in Alibaba, the Cayman Island shell company. You saying, what's going on here? That shell company has an agreement with the Chinese operating company where it gives the capital it raises from capital markets to the Chinese company and the Chinese company supplies revenues and profits to the shell company. In other words, this is a contrivance that these companies have created to get around a Chinese restriction that these companies are in sensitive sectors and foreign investors are not supposed to hold these companies. Now, here's a scary thought. When you buy shares in Alibaba, the shell company, man, you're relying on this operating agreement to keep you afloat. The question is whether their operating agreement is really legal. Now, so far, the Chinese government has looked the other direction because the lure of raising billions and billions of capital on a foreign market might overwhelm any need for control. But you're an awfully, awfully dangerous ground here. And it also means corporate governance is a, it's not just a mess, it's a joke. As shareholders in Alibaba, you might have control over the shell company, but you have zero power in how the operating company works. On top of all of this uh, corporate governance stuff, each of these companies also has cross-holding structures, some fully owned, majority owned, minority owned that are complete and total mess. Com opaque and sometimes non-visible, that you have to take the accountants at their word. One final thought, and this is going to be the lead-in to the discussion for today. Now, each of these companies, as, as it's grown, has had some help along the way. Now, I would argue that these companies succeeded because Beijing was on their side, but it helped that Beijing was on their side when they got into fights. In fact, uh, I think we underestimate the effect that governments have on value. And what I've tried to do in this fairly complex picture is show you all the ways in which governments can affect the value of individual companies. Think of it as a generic picture. This is true in every, gov every country in the world, every government. Let's think about the ways in which governments can help and hurt you. So the green font is for all of the things governments can do to help you. And the red font is for all of the things they can do to hurt you. So if you're a company, think of some of the stuff that governments can do to increase revenue growth. They can buy your products. Maybe they're a customer. They could restrict competitors. They could subsidize your consumers to buy your products. They can require consumers to buy your products, all of which can push up revenue growth. You think this is great. Be careful what you wish for because they can also work in the other direction. They can use antitrust or market share restrictions to, cause to, to keep you from growing. They can actively promote competitors, domestic or foreign, against you. They can penalize your consumers for buying your product or service. Maybe they don't like them buying your product or service. And sometimes they can ban some groups of customers from buying your product or service. So... Governments can affect revenue growth. Can they affect margins? Yes. They might give you raw materials at discounted prices. Maybe they uh, own the, the maybe the mines are owned by the government and they can supply you a resource at low cost. Maybe they can ensure you can get low cost of free labor. Maybe they can give you special tax breaks. The margins are after tax. Or they can cut in the other direction. They can increase the cost of your raw material by adding taxes to that. 
They can use labor laws to increase the amount you pay as wages and benefits to your employees. You can have regulatory add-ons that add to your operating costs. You can increase taxes on you. As for growth and investment efficiency, in some cases, governments can help you by providing you free or subsidized resources, give you free land to build your factory, give you investment tax credits, or they can make life difficult for you. When it comes to cost of equity and cost of debt, governments can help you on, a- on the equity front by actually investing in your equity, buying shares in your company. They could require some types of investors to hold your company's equity. Maybe they can say, you know, financial and service companies need to own a certain percentage of certain classes of shares. Or they can provide tax benefits to your investors for holding your shares. Conversely, they can make life difficult for you by restricting who can hold your shares. They can say foreign investors can't hold your shares. That reduces the demand for your shares, increase your cost of equity. Or in some cases, they can hold what's called a golden share, where they don't really actually own equity, but they can have veto power over big decisions. That pushes up your cost of equity. On the cost of debt, there are times when governments lend to companies at subsidized rates because they want you to grow. They can require banks to lend to you at lower rates or give you bigger tax benefits from borrowing. All will push down your cost of debt. Or they can make life more difficult by restricting lending to your company or taking away your tax benefits. But there's one final component in where governments can help or hurt you. One is they can act as lenders of last resort, come in and save you from distress or default, restrict lenders from pushing you into default. That's a good sign. Or they can make life difficult and put your life, you know, put your corporate life at risk by nationalizing you or taking away your assets or using legislation to shut down your businesses. Put simply, governments can help you and they can hurt you. Now, don't take me wrong. This is true for every government in every part of the world. So you're saying, why pick on the Chinese government? Well, let's face it. If governments have powers, Chinese gov- the Chinese government has superpowers. And let's think of why. Now, normally when governments change laws or regulations, it takes a while to work through the process and make the changes. And there's always a chance that those changes can be reversed if you put enough pressure on the government or the government changes. And it, the Chinese government doesn't have to worry about either of those, right? If the Chinese government wants to change laws, it can change them overnight. It can change them more decisively and tell you with a fair degree of certainty that that law will now be the law for the next 30 years. There's no regime change or a new government that's going to come in and reverse laws. So when changes are made by the Chinese government, they can be bigger, they can be quicker and more permanent than changes made by other governments. Of course, one reason governments have to restrain themselves in over-helping or over-hurting companies is there are checks and balances. In what sense? Well, if you overreach and try to take away something that belongs to a company, the company can sue and try to stop you from doing it. So you worry about the gauntlets of legal challenges you have to go through. How, and you can use these legal challenges not just to slow down rules, but to sometimes stop them. I may be cynical, but um, I've never heard of a Chinese government legal change that was reversed because a Chinese court told the government that what it was doing was illegal. And finally, I do agree that Chinese government, like every other government, um, values growth. And that's part of the reason they've looked the other direction when companies have cut corners. As in the case of variable interest entities. I mean, let's face it, that even if it's not breaking the law, it's breaking the spirit of the law. But the government is okay because it got growth. And many investors assume that that desire for growth would keep Chinese, the Chinese government from overreaching. But what I think these observers were missing is while the Chinese government values growth, it values control even more. And Chinese tech companies have become a threat to that control. In what way? They're big and they have more value than China would like them to have. And more importantly, they're collecting data from consumers. And we live in a world where information gives you power. And for the Chinese government, I think that data, more than any accumulation of value, is what's concerning Beijing. I know that many of these changes that the Chinese government is making are cloaked in. We're trying to protect consumers. We're doing for, for, you know, from 
privacy. We're trying to make the market more competitive, but I don't believe it for a moment. I think this is a game for control and the Chinese government would be perfectly happy if Chinese tech companies continue to violate consumer privacy as long as they share that information with the Chinese government. That may be a cynical view, but that's what I see. So now let's take a look at our four companies and look at how the Chinese government is affecting value. So the approach this year is what I did. I took each of my four companies and I did three scenarios. The middle scenario, government is a net negative, is my most likely scenario. I think that's where we are given what's happened over the last year and a half is with these big Chinese tech companies. China, the Chinese government helps in some dimensions, hurts in others, but net, it's a net negative. But it could be far worse. The government could actively become an adversary of these companies. So let's think of that as a worst case scenario. And a best case scenario is that goes back to being just a benefactor where it picks the company as the winner and gives it all the power it needs to have. So government is benefactor, government is net negative, government is adversary. I did my valuations around my three big inputs, revenue growth, margin, and cost of capital. And you can see, taking Tencent as an example, that if the government is a benefactor, I have higher growth, higher margins, and a much higher value per share than if government is a net negative. And if government is a net negative, I have a higher growth, higher margins, and higher and a higher value per share than if government is an adversary. In fact, as using the net negative scenario as my base case, it looks to me like Tencent is undervalued given how much the stock price has dropped. At 471.8, it's undervalued by about 8%. But if you really, really fear the Chinese government, there's more pain to come. It's overvalued then by about 34%. But if you think the you know, Chinese government would return to being a benefactor of the company, you yeah, could have a lot of upside there. With Alibaba, I find it undervalued by about 13% under the net negative scenario. It could be even more undervalued if the government returns to the benefactor, but I have a feeling it's not. But here there might be a much greater chance of the government being an adversary because after all, it was ja Jack Ma who was part of the process that caused this round of crackdowns with this initial pushback against the Chinese government. On JD.com and DD, my net negative valuations suggest that these companies are close to fairly value. Now, the undervalued by 2% or 4% is really too close to zero to be significantly different from zero. But with DD, I get a much wider range. As a young company with a business model still in flux, DD is much more exposed to what the Chinese government might do or might not do. And you can see that reflect the range of valuations. Worst case, the Chinese government clearly continues to crack down. And I've given you some of the things that the government has done with each of these companies. With Tencent and Alibaba, they find the companies substantial amounts, one and a half billion, 2.75 billion, you know, for an, using antitrust laws and abusing market position. But with Alibaba, they actually stopped the IPO of Ant Financial, Alipay, last year. And that made a big difference. JD.com, so far, it's, they've been fined for reporting, misreporting price and false promotions, but you can see the other shoes waiting to drop. With DD, the government has actually taken a much stronger view of stopping DD from accepting new users and requiring DD to pay fines for not disclosing acquisitions. So with Didi, the potential is there that if the government chooses to be an adversary, the company is worth close to nothing. But if it eases up and becomes a beneficiary, it could be worth 173. The range is much wider. And perhaps that's a more general lesson to take out of this, you know, which is that with young companies, the consequences of government action and inaction can be much greater than the value of the company. Now, of course, there's no point valuing companies in the abstract, and I've never believed in doing it. I think that when you value companies, you have to be willing to act on it. In this case, you know, here's what I would do based on these valuations. I would take DD and JD out of the mix because they're pretty close to fairly valued. Alibaba and Tencent are both undervalued, and I have three choices. I can buy both companies. I can buy one of the two based not just upon the valuation, but upon the rest of what I see in the company. Or maybe I'm going to cop out and use I'm terrified of the Chinese government as my excuse for buying neither. I thought about all three scenarios, but I ended up picking the second one, which is I ended up buying one of the two. And the company I picked was Tencent. 
It's a little less undervalued than Alibaba at the net negative, 8% versus 13%. Here's the, here are the three reasons I picked Tencent. I picked it because I think it's a more rounded company and it's a, in terms of the business mix it's in. And that WeChat platform is, I think, you know, adds, adds a premium to the valuation. The same reason I continue to hold Facebook in my portfolio. So I like it as a company, more businesses. The second is I, you know, I prefer Tencent's Hong Kong listing with all of its limitations to the, the, the shell company that I'm buying on the NASDAQ when I buy Alibaba. And finally, you know, I like Jack Ma as a person. I think he's a visionary, but, you know, by linking his personality to the company, I think, you know, he's exposing them to more risk. And I think it played out in last year's critique that he did, you know, at the conference. The next thing you know, Alibaba paid the price. And the reason I don't want to buy both is, I know, for me, this worry about the Chinese government will is real and long term. And I just want to hold one of these two. And I would prefer to hold Tencent, which leaves me with a final question of how exactly to invest in Tencent. You're saying, well, what do you mean? I could invest in Tencent directly, either in the Hong Kong exchange listing or on the ADR in the U.S. Or I could buy Nasdaq. You're saying, what? It's a South African company. Well, there's an interesting story here. It's one of the great valuation stories of all time. Naspers is a South African holding company that in 20, 2001 put $32 million into a company called Tencent in return for almost half of the company. Perhaps one of the greatest VC investments of all time. That 46.5%, of course, has surged to tens of billions of dollars. And by 2018-2019, Naspers had become a proxy for Tencent. 80% of its value came from Tencent with one qualifier. The market attached about a 25 to 30% discount on the value. of So in other words, $100 billion worth of Tencent stock was valued about 75 to 80 billion. Now, before you jump to the conclusion, the markets have gone crazy. This is irrational. Remember that this has to factor in any liquidation costs and taxes that might come due if NASPERS actually liquidated the holding. But by buying NASPERS, I'm effectively buying Tencent at a discount. Now, I was tempted to buy NASPERS, but the reason I didn't is that discount is not something trans that's going to go away. It's not something that is transient. And in fact, NASPERS has been trying. That's in fact the, the only job I think at NASPERS right now is how to make that discount disappear. It's been trying. And it, it in fact created a Dutch entity called Process, took some of its Tencent holdings, put into Process, hoping the discount would disappear. Guess what? The discount continues. It was a little smaller, but it's still there which tells me that this discount is not something that comes from behavioral mistakes. It is something real. So rather than separate my investment in Tencent 2.4 by going into NASPERS and worrying about the corporate governance on NASPERS and NASPERS on top of the corporate governance at Tencent, I chose to buy Tencent. Now, do I feel certain that I make money? Of course not. No. But if I'm going to make a bet on China, Tencent looks as good a bet as any other that I will make. So let me wrap up. Now, in, in valuations, we, we almost never consider the effects of government policy and regulations explicitly. And we have two arguments we use for why we don't do it. First is that, um, that governments are net neutral. In other words, they help, they hurt, but it always nets out, which is strange because why do they need to? As you can see in the trade-off, sometimes they can help, sometimes they can hurt, but it allows us to ignore governments. The other is that it's already in the numbers. So if governments, um, the governments are affecting my margins and my growth, it's already in the numbers that I see from the past, so I don't have to explicitly bring it in. That works, that argument of ignoring government works un until you get to a shift in government policy. And that's where we are with Chinese tech companies. We can't just assume the status quo, that things will look like they did in the past because the Chinese government clearly has decided to change the rules of this game. And with Chinese tech companies, I think we have to accommodate the change that's going to come because the Chinese government has moved on to more activist and punitive version of itself. So I think that ultimately these changes are driven, as I said, by China's desire for control over both companies and data. I do think that the adjustment we've seen in market prices over the last year of these companies, though it looks horrendously large, 
is merited given the real changes happening at these companies because the government has cracked down. I do think the market is over adjusted in the case of Tencent and Alibaba. And I'm going to make my bet on Tencent and hope that um, the price bounces back once markets recognize that overreaction. But I might be barking up the wrong tree. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.